Hello, readers. Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a New York Times bestselling author. His newest book is titled Don't Be a Feminist, Essays on Genuine Justice. Brian, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? Fantastic. So this book combines some of the best writing from your econ log blog from 2005 to 2022 with a new essay titled don't be a feminist a letter to my daughter let's start mm -hmm. with that new essay brian what made you want to write it to begin with honestly it was having a daughter because once i my daughter was born 10 years ago i very soon started thinking she's probably going to be hearing a lot about feminism when she gets a bit older what do i tell her about it I'd long had my reservations about it, but I spent a lot of years writing this essay in my head. And then about a year ago, I decided, okay, now I feel ready. She's still too young to actually read it, but uh, I can now get this all off my chest and it can be there waiting for her as soon as she wants to talk about it. So you have a 10 year old daughter. I actually have an mm -hmm. eight year old daughter in my household. I obviously mm -hmm. can't speak for yours. Mine is incredibly smart. She is fiercely independent to a fault. And so mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason why I took a little bit of extra interest in this intriguing title. Ah. Before we get into some of the specifics, what exactly do you mean by feminist? Great question. Honestly, my starting point is always to just find out the way that words are conventionally used. I'm not someone that tries to rank people with some new definition. I start with a dictionary. Unfortunately, this is a case where the dictionary is just plainly wrong. Mm -hmm. If you look at a bunch of dictionaries, you'll see they give you a definition along the lines of feminism is the view that society, uh, that society sh uh, should treat men and women equally, politically, economically, socially. We know this is wrong because we've got good public opinion data where you ask people, are you a feminist or not? And also, do you believe that society should treat men and women equally, politically, socially, and economically? Feminists, as you would expect, say yes, men and women should be equal. Also, non-feminists say yes, men and women should be equal. So for that to be the definition, it would be like saying a feminist is someone who thinks the, the sky is blue. It's like, all right, they believe it, but guess what? It is not a position unique to them. It is just liable on the other side to act as if this is not a widely shared view. And that is why I stepped back and said, if the standard definition is incorrect, what is a definition that actually fits regular usage? Again, I'm not trying to be the language police or force anyone to change the way they're using words. I'm just trying to describe what is in fact the way that people use the word in our society. And that is where I offer the definition that I use in the essay. I say feminism is the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. It's the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. I say this is a good definition because first of all, almost everyone that is a feminist believes that our society uh, does in fact treat men more fairly than women. Second of all, almost everyone who is not a feminist will either say not true or I don't know. Right? So it is something where if you're not a feminist, then you generally just refuse to go along with the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. So now we've got that on the table. And from there, we are ready to actually have a productive conversation based upon the way the word is in fact used. So you, with your econ uh, economics background, decide mm -hmm. to look at the data, to mm -hmm. examine various categories, to see just mm -hmm. how unequal outcomes are mm -hmm. for men versus women. And, and uh, to, uh, to be very blunt about it, sometimes there are cases where you look at uh, where maybe women have it easier than men. So oh, yeah. what were some of the categories yes. that you looked at and what was the ultimate outcome from your research? Right, so there's really two steps here. All right, once we have on the table that feminism is the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women, first step is to say, all right, well, what's a list of at least candidate reasons where, or candidate ways where society does in fact treat men more fair than women? And there's a standard list, things like the pay gap. All right, but then the next step is, all right, well, are there any ways that our society might at least seem to people to treat men less fair than women? less fairly than women. And again, here, it's very easy to come up with a whole lot of ways. You can see men are more likely to be in prison, men are more likely to be homeless, to, die, to commit suicide, and so on. Right now, uh, this is stuff that you can do without being an economist. This is just going and getting raw numbers. Uh, but where economics has something extra to say is this. 
Just because there's inequality doesn't mean there's unfairness. It could be that the inequality is due to differences in performance. It has not been, un it has not been unfair of the Olympics to deny me a gold medal, hmm. right? I have less than the average number of gold medals for a human because the average is greater than zero and I have zero exactly. The reason though, I'd say pretty obviously, is that I have not even tried to win a medal. And if I did try, I wouldn't be good right? in any sport, actually. There's no way I would be qualified to compete in the Olympics in any way. I could then go and say, oh, the Olympics is not fair, but it's been totally fair. It's just it, fairness is, in this case yields inequality. Um, now, economists since the time of the great Gary Becker have been looking at these kinds of inequalities and trying to assess why they exist. Is it just some kind of arbitrary antipathy towards a group that is underperforming? Or are there in fact differences in the kind of performance that we do, that we see by sex or whatever? Uh, obviously, if we just start with men are far more, far more likely to be in prison, there's a real simple story of this that has nothing to do with discrimination against men. How about men commit a lot more serious crime than women? Duh, right? But once we accept that that is a reasonable debunking or at least large debunking of the crime gap for men and women, we can apply that kind of technique across the board. So we can look at things like the pay gap and many people have. Why is it that in fact men earn a lot more money on average than women? There are many reasons that we can go through. A lot of them are things like men are a lot more likely to major in STEM and work in STEM jobs. Women don't. It's not that they're not allowed to, it's that given a choice, they don't generally want to. If you are a woman and you do STEM, then guess what? You make a lot more money because those jobs pay better. Even simpler things like whether you're working full-time or part-time. And then once you say full-time, once you realize full-time is actually everything from 35 hours a week all the way up to like 80 hours a week, men are more likely to not only be working full-time rather than part-time, but also to be doing the really intense, all demanding jobs which then leads to higher pay, right? So anyway, after all of this, I go through a lot of these and with some exceptions we can talk about, I see the real story is that almost all of the complaints about gender unfairness are grossly exaggerated and often just don't seem to hold up at all. So our society is just a lot more fair to both men and women that, than, than any kind of complainer would expect. What are some of those exceptions, Brian? Ah. Um, so the really big ones, I say, if you go to other countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, until recently, women were not legally allowed to drive, things like that. So you can say, so Saudi Arabia is a country where they almost certainly do treat, uh, treat women less fairly than men or treat men more fairly than women. Um, then uh, you'll see just a little bit more speculative, but probably even bigger. Uh, there's a lot of ev evidence of selective female infanticide in China and India. Right. And again, that's not part of our society, but still what I say is if I were in Saudi Arabia or China or India, in those cases, I would actually say, fine, then I'll hear feminism is correct. doesn't mean that you should buy the whole package, but still those are societies where you can say, yes, well, on balance, they are probably treating women less fairly than men. Although obviously you want to go and check some other things and say, hmm, well, are there any things, any things on the other side? Perhaps we just don't know enough about India and China to say. Saudi Arabia, I think I'm pretty confident that women are being badly treated there. Yeah, and I think that another important point, and I'm not recalling if you mentioned this in your essay mm -hmm. or not, is that things are never going to be completely one-to-one. -one, and it's important mm -hmm. to teach young humans that unfortunately, as messed up as it may seem, we don't always live in a fair world. And the mm -hmm. sooner you're able to get over the idea of fair or unfair, the sooner you're going to have an advantage over a lot of other people in this world who are just going to sit there and complain because things aren't fair enough. Mm -hmm. to do. Right. That isn't really the main message, but I do agree with that. I mean, the main message is just that you think that women are being treated unfairly in our society and relative to men, and that's incorrect. It is true, of course, that both men and women get treated unfairly sometimes because right? life is not fair. Right. And again, if you were just to say that feminism is the view that our society treats women unfairly, it's like, well, then it's true because everyone gets treated unfairly, including women. But the whole point of calling it feminism is to highlight some special unfairness, some extra unfairness that women are enduring. And that's where I say the evidence is really flimsy. So what makes... Now, for, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. In terms of 
it, what's the constructive attitude? It is, it's also worth saying, yeah, like even if life has been totally unfair to you, wallowing self-pity is not constructive. Uh, but there's a big difference between saying you're wallowing in self-pity, it's justified, but it's not constructive versus you're wallowing in self-pity, it is unjustified and also unconstructive. The latter case is one where it's like, come on, like, let's get over this. All right. And again, I think it is one if you just accept like you haven't been mistreated. You are mistaken to think that you've been mistreated. That's really easy to get over once you accept that. Uh, whereas to say, yeah, is you know, like you've been dealt a really bad hand, but uh, that's not constructive to, to complain about it. That requires a higher level of wisdom and self-discipline, and hopefully people can reach it too. Uh, but you know, it's it's much easier if you can just say, look, you are under the false belief that you are being treated unfairly. That's not correct. Uh, reminds me of a fantastic neglected movie, The Upside of Anger. Since people probably are never going to see it, or if you have, you've forgotten it. The punchline of it is that at the beginning of a movie, the father of a family of, I think, four girls absconds with a secretary, never no, 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 puts them in no contact forever, you know, just completely cuts them off. They don't hear from him. And then the mom is incredibly angry, turns to drink, tells all the daughters what a horrible bastard their father is. And then at the, at the end of the movie, they actually find out that he did not run away with the secretary. He actually fell into a ditch and died a year earlier. They find the body. And wow. then it's like, oh, we've been hating this guy for being unfair. And it turns out that we were wrong about what he did. What a relief. Now we are sad of that, he, that he was a good father who died instead of angry that he was a bad father who abandoned us. And just to see that part and to realize, wow, all the whole emotional tenor of the movie has been a trick. And, they, and, the, and the viewer has gone along with the whole time. God, I hate that guy so much. He's so terrible. How could he treat his family this way? It's like, oh, he died in an accident and nobody knew. Well, that changes a lot, doesn't it? Sure yeah. does. What a fun emotional roller coaster ride that movie sounds like. The upside yeah, of it's, anger. It's, 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 the, whole thing is, the whole thing is great. Yes, yeah. Uh, it was the movie that changed my mind about Mike Binder, who previously I considered a sort of medium talent actor. And then after uh, I said, wait, you broke that? Man, I was wrong about you, Mike. You're a fantastic screenwriter. I've taken everything bad about you back. <laughs> good writer, good director as well. He did a really good job on the Comedy Store documentary that came out a little while ago. Oh, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that. So to wrap up the uh, feminist essay, what hmm. makes for a good feminist then? Hmm. Well, I mean, I'd say really the best feminist is not to be one, at least in our society. Uh, but I do say that there are better and worse, of course. Um, you know, there's, there's one where I say, well, you could say the best ones are people like Warren Farrell who go and just say it's all wrong and a tr true feminist is to acknowledge that. And that's kind of a cop out uh, to say a guy who basically rejects it all is the best one. Uh, I say like the, what's not a cop out is usually you know, left-leaning labor economists who know the numbers and admit that the actual descriptive claims of the feminist movement are highly exaggerated, but then say, well, but we should still have feminist values. <laughs> say, That's the be that, is, that is as good as it gets. So I still disagree with it, but at least they are acknowledging a whole lot of mistakes of the rest of the movement. You know, honestly, I just wish that they would take these truths to the less informed slash more dogmatic members of their own group and say, hey, stop doing this. Stop making up false accusations against others. Uh, but at least they are people who work with data and will make most of the reasonable concessions. So much better than the, uh, than the alternative. Taking a look at some of your other essays in this book, I am a sucker whenever you attach the word Orwellian in front of or ah. <laughs> after another term. So I was intrigued by the Orwellian othering essay. Mm -hmm. but I'd never heard of othering before. So for those yeah. who are in my category, what exactly is othering? Right. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, you're probably going to be soon because all kinds of ivory tower poison has been leaking into the real world in the last few years, all the way into mandatory training sessions for people with just regular jobs who work in a bank or whatever. Uh, othering is basically a moral, mor morally objectionable treating of people as a outgroup who do uh, whose uh, welfare doesn't count. So the idea, you know, you know, like a classic example would be like an old cowboy movie where the Indians are clearly portrayed as being an alien group. And if we shoot them, then great. And, you know, there really were movies like this. But anyway, that's othering is basically you know, defining there's our in-group, we're the people who count. Then there's that horrible out-group. 
they're they are, they're scum they're different from us and their lives don't matter to destroy them is no loss right so this is something that's taught in a lot of grievance study classes in the ivory tower of oh you are guilty of othering what a horrible person you are right and what i say in that piece is that this is a very strange case because the very people that complain a lot about othering do it themselves to a much greater degree than anyone that they're accusing does right so just the extent to which you can see that people in grievance studies departments will invoke the name of another race with audible contempt like white like, <laughs> the number of times that these days you can hear anyone in regular media say the name of any other of any other race with that highly hostile and to the antipathetic tone almost never but you can go to a college classroom or just listen to an activist and just listen to the way they pronounce the word white with contempt by like indicating these people are not part of our group they are outsiders they don't count and whatever happens to them tough luck haha ha. so is the ultimate example in modern times the straight white male then yes or even better yet the, the cis straight white male yeah. <laughs> just add on, uh, add on cisgender just for additional contempt. But again, this is something that used to be only be in the ivory tower, but you can definitely see it in popular culture right now. Um, I, I remember on Dexter, there's a blogger who's talking about some serial killer and saying, a cis straight white male, right? Each word adding on further contempt and disdain for this broad category where you can say, look, it's not like I even asked to be part of this. I'm just born into this group. So why is it that I'm being treated as an unperson, to use another Orwellian phrase, based upon my demographics? Yeah, I know you cover this in a different essay, but it's a lot like nationalism. Like, I, you know, it's the old Bill Hicks bit. I had no control over where my parents procreated. I was yelling from the sea, do it in Paris, do it in Paris, but they just so happened to have done it in America. So here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, nationalism is... You know, like it, like it still is the you know, the biggest form of othering. Uh, you know, so like oh, they're Ukrainians, they're terrible. You know that kind of thing. Right. Uh, what's Orwellian though is when you do it a lot while saying it's terrible. Yeah. Right. There's one thing where like there's just the simple othering of saying you know Total you speech. guys belong to another group. Boo. Right. And but then there's the version of do you know what's the worst thing in the world? Going and looking at people from another group and saying boo. And you know and you know what else? I hate cisgendered straight white males. It's double so again, speak. Something is Orwellian does not necessarily mean it's the worst version. It's just a, a particularly odd flavor of it where you would think that, that anyone who was doing it would have their head explode from the inconsistency, but obviously not. Well, it's double speak, and there's also a hint of two yes. minutes of hate in there as well. Oh, yeah. yeah where you're two, allowed two to get hate. outraged because it's a very specific group, and everybody can yell mm -hmm. in unison to get that frustration out. Yes, yes. Um, I, I mean, the, the other unusual thing, of course, is that many people that are complaining about these horrible demographics actually belong to them. Uh, so it's, you know, you know, that's almost unprecedented for someone to try to gain status by denouncing their own group as being terrible. But it's but it is sort of like you know it's kind of like self-flagellation where like I am so unworthy I am terrible which makes me so much better than everyone who doesn't realize that they are unworthy and terrible. At least I whip myself unlike the other sinners so I'm one of the higher class sinners. <laughs> Another one of your essays is titled "Touchy Feely Bull in a China Shop." Mm -hmm. So your son's got a taste of public high school before returning to homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And you said that part of the problem was that most of their classes were too touchy feely. What exactly mm -hmm. did you mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, think about a history class. A touchy feely one is where instead of teaching you facts and what really happened, they start trying to get you to say, well, well how would you feel if you were living in the time of Elvis Presley? Right? <laughs> that kind of thing. Or where instead of being able to write an essay, they say, let's go and do an art project about ancient Assyria. That doesn't show that you understand anything about ancient Assyria. Like, do they have a monarchy? Was it a republic? What was their system? And they had a lot of classes like this, so there was almost no discussion of any actual intellectual content that could be right or wrong. But there was a lot of focus on what are your feelings? What would it be like? Let's do it. Let's work in a group project where we all talk about our feelings. And the interesting thing I said is that people who are touchy feely 
think of themselves just being nice and treating people well. And my story is, look, some people like this kind of thing. For other people, it hurts. People that actually value facts and reasoning and the acquisition of knowledge, when you are touchy-feely around them, you are hurting them. They are suffering. And the fact that they're different from you doesn't mean that, that, and the, and that they don't tell you about it because they don't talk about their feelings doesn't mean that they are not, in fact, enduring great pain. And my sons were so miserable with this, but because they are low emotion people, they are not prone to express, especially not prone to expressing negative emotion, people pretend like they are actually having a good time. And again, the strange thing, again, there's a, you know, something a bit Orwellian about this touchy-feely approach. In an old school class, you suffer, but there's no pretense that you aren't suffering. Mm-hmm. If there's the math teacher who says, you know, well, now we will do 50 more to problems with two equations and two unknowns, everybody get to work, right? There's no expectation that you'll go and say, oh, I just love doing this. It's so great. You can groan and it's like, yeah, maybe you don't like it. That's too bad, right? So in a class like that, at least there is the freedom to be unhappy <laughs> and a recognition that a person might not be because, yeah, it's not fun. On the other hand, in the touchy-feely class, there's this added horror of everyone's going to be really enjoying this. Oh, isn't it great class? Let's all break it, break into groups. Oh, isn't this fun? Let's share our names. Let's decorate our name tags. And given the tone, it's not acceptable just to say, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? This is a waste of my time. <laughs> Whereas in a traditional class, you're like, at least you are allowed to be miserable. So like here, you're like making someone do something you don't want to do while also there's this more uh, emotional blackmail of, of course, you're happy, right? Kids love it this way. Kids love, I mean, I still remember hearing multiple teachers say, and kids love it. Like, my kids don't love it. Why are you speaking for all kids? Are they expected to pretend and live this lie that they want to go and do your stupid posters? No, that's, they don't. that's exhausting, by the way. Constantly asking <laughs> anybody to be in touch with their emotions. Sometimes you just need to be. And negative emotions are a part of the process, by the way. Mm-hmm. We're in a weird place in society where you're no longer, I mean, you're allowed to have negative emotions, but if you're having negative emotions, it immediately needs to be treated or you need to talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes mm-hmm. it's okay to figure out uh, how to work your way through the range mm-hmm. of emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And of course there's also, it would be helpful to calm down. <laughs> yeah, that too. I'm glad you mentioned emotions because the last essay is when may we be happy? And the point of this essay is that uh, you will always have reasons to either be happy or to be upset. And it's really up to you to set that tone. You actually give uh, 10 different pieces of advice on how to be happy. Things like continue ignoring the news unless it affects you personally. Love that one. Break bad, but weakly enforced rules that get in your way. What's the last bad but weakly enforced rule that you just decided to say, screw it, Brian? Well, I mean, during COVID, almost everything. (laughs) Good call. So I guess like the last time I was really aggressively breaking rules was I was vacationing in Italy and they had like everything else in Italy was open, but on trains, even though like we're like this, how is this any different from being in a mall? But on trains, they were still enforcing masking. I'd be, you know, all, as usual, always with the food and drink exception. Yeah. It's like, all right, well, I have a can of Pringles out. So I'll eat one, one Pringle every five minutes. And so I'm following your rule. Right. Or, you know, so anyway, that, that was a big one where it's like, like, this is a ridiculous rule. Whatever risk that I'm imposing on others is so microscopic compared to the inconvenience you're imposing on me. I'm just going to break it. And I'll, uh, there was actually a time, you know, like, uh, there, there were a couple of Italians who came and yelled at us, uh, especially me. One time there was actually an Italian train cop who heard the yelling and came over to, to back up the, uh, the vigilante. But again, nothing, nothing happened at the end because you know, I, I, I correctly ascertained that these rules are very weakly enforced. So you know, like, uh, again, it's one thing to follow a rule that actually makes sense. And I'm happy to do that on my own, whether it's a rule or not. But if I think the rule's stupid, I'm going to break it. And, and, you know, unless I'm going to get punished harshly. The interesting thing is that there's just a lot of rules that are not very enforced and it's basically just internally motivated. And I don't have that internal motivation for a stupid rule. You know, my Boy, motivation is to defy. 
Boy, ignore. I'm I'm the same way. And ignoring some of the stupid COVID rules had to have been especially difficult working at a university. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there they continued with masking classes and um, you know, like, like yeah, long after everybody else in the world is back to normal. It's like the, you realize these people, this is a commuter campus. We aren't living in the middle of nowhere in Alaska here. So all these kids go and have all these other activities. Like what possible marginal gain do you think you're getting out of immiserating the entire, the entire school during this? Or really uh, immiserating 90, 90% while gratifying 10% of people who are enumerate or hmm possibly just ultra high risk. But again, should the whole world revolve around a few such people? I say no. I say no as well. He is Brian Kaplan. The new book is Don't Be a Feminist, Essays on Genuine Justice. Get it now wherever books are sold. Brian, thank you so much. Actually, actually, you get it only on Amazon. It is an Amazon exclusive. Uh, the book is, the paperback is just 12 bucks. The ebook is 9.99. And guess what? Despite historic inflation right now, I have not raised the price at all. So buy now. Love it. Thank you so much for the time, Brian. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.